My name is Tamim Antoniadis, I'm the creative director at Ninja Theory, and we created DMC Devil May Cry. So this is Devil May Cry, DMC Devil May Cry, which is the fifth in a long-running series of Devil May Cry games that were originated in Japan, made by Capcom. It's very much a character-based action game where the main protagonist in the original series was this kind of, like, really ostentatious anime-style character with twin pistols and a sword, demon hunter who killed demons to the soundtrack of Japanese rock. And Capcom came to us and asked us to do a complete reimagining of it, um, sort of like an alternate version of it, and base it in the West. And they wanted us to find a completely new style that was distinct from the previous version. We took the concept of Rebellion, which is also the name of Dante's sword, and then tried to explore what Rebellion looks like today. And we drew a lot of inspiration from kind of Western Rebellion, so Jack Kerouac, the Sex Pistols in particular, there was a documentary called The Filth and the Fury by Julian Temple about the Sex Pistols, which was done in a punkish style. So a lot of the, the layers, the UI, the feel of this whole game is sort of this mix of punk rock. So Dante has some of um, James Dean in him. He's got a lot of the Sex Pistols in him. I mean, those guys, they were only 18 or 19 years old and they basically blew the doors open on the establishment. But there was also, at the time of the game, there was the, the financial crisis. We thought it'd be fun to turn the demons into the establishment. So it's quite a grotesque satire on our everyday life and the frustrations that the youth have in particular because they're at the brunt of that. So we thought the game should be just an expression of anger and rebellion, drawing on street fashion, cinema, music, politics, media, like bring it all together into a big pot and turn it into a big old grotesque satire. Once we had this kind of, if you like, this massive board of references for all these cultural touching points, how then do you turn that into a game? There was one concept in particular that was quite key, which was this idea of an alternate dimension. So it's not that dissimilar to the upside down in Stranger Things, that there was a parallel dimension where Dante could see the truth behind the demon veil. You know? A lot of these ideas just come from different people in the team. So one of the art directors had this idea that the world was alive, that it would have the equivalent of blood and bone and arteries, and it could move and transform and it could react. Like the enemies were like blood cells that were spawning from this world being, this demonic being. And that really underpinned all of the environments in the game. So rather than going for the original Gothic fantasy, you know, churches and cathedrals of the original Devil May Cry, which were cool, this idea of a living, breathing, evil, demonic world tied in all these different locations in the game. It starts with something that was based on Santa Monica Pier. We move to something that looks like streets of Genoa in Italy. We move to a massive club which is based on Panorama Bar in Berlin. And we're going through all these different levels and touch points around the world, but it's united by this one concept. And that's something we always look for in our games. It's like, what's the one thing that can unite all the concepts together into something consistent? So in this section, we see him literally, we're birthing the new character. So he's in his birthday suit, naked. And as the scene progresses, we thought it'd be cool to find a, a really cool way to get him to dress into the new version of himself. It's all very ordinary clothes, if you like, tank tops, jeans. You know, he's not wearing the big cowboy boots and things that he was in the original series, but that was part of making him feel just a little bit more, well, a lot more grounded. The heart of Devil May Cry is the combat mechanic. Capcom Japan came and visited us every two or three months um, for the full two and a half years or so of development. They wouldn't touch any code or animation, but they would tell us their philosophy. And the philosophy of Devil May Cry is that it has to be super fast and responsive, and that anything you want to do, or you think you should be able to do, we should let you do. And this results in a very, very freeform style of combat where you can just flow from one move into another and you can become really good at it. You know, experiment and find your way through the buttons. But the more you play, the more nuance you find and the more complexity you find. It's sort of like playing a piano. You can plink and plonk 
and make some melodies, but you can keep practicing and, and start to make some really good songs. But whereas Capcom had Paul Devil May Cries to get it right, we had to get it right on our first go. We would really listen, listen to the Capcom guys, the people like Itsuno-san who had experience creating previous DMCs, listen to them about how to do frame-perfect moves and response times on, on the controller. We would record the screen and the button inputs to make, you know, at high speed, and then check frame by frame to make sure that the button inputs and the animation response was as tight as it could be. When the character turns, we didn't do any kind of, you know, of those flourishes that you see in, in, in modern games now where the character leans in and turns around. We just went, bang, straight into the turn. So it was very much a philosophy of do everything possible to make everything as responsive as possible for the player, which is a different philosophy to how I think a lot of Western studios operate. So it took a while to get into that mindset. And well, once we were there, we were just flying. We just had more moves, more combat, more out there stuff. Once we needed a philosophy, we'd go crazy. Whatever we thought sounded cool, we would add and then test it out. And it all seemed to just kind of come together. It was great. When we first announced the game, which was really early in development, uh, with a trailer, like the, the response was not good. There was a really bad online reaction against the game. They felt like the game strayed too far from the original Devil May Cry. But that is exactly what Capcom wanted us to do. They wanted us to stray. There was a lot of criticism and mistrust because we weren't Capcom. We were a Western developer doing this game. There was no faith at all in our ability to deliver. A real backlash, like hundreds and hundreds of messages being sent to the studio. We got death threats, we got threats of violence, we got you know, a torrent. All that stuff is now is pretty common. That was like a, the first massive blowback, I'd say, from a product announcement of this nature. And this is all before anyone had actually, you know, seen a second of gameplay or laid hands on the game. And that just kept going and going. The media got involved as well. It's like it turned into a snowball effect, you know. Everyone in the world decided that this was going to be a failure of a game. Most of the abuse came my way. I was the creative director, so I was responsible. And the rest of the team could just get on with it, you know. The only response to something like that is to do your job, which is what we did. When we started to show gameplay and people were showing, you know, what you could do in the game, consensus shifted from, OK, so maybe the game's all right, but it's not Devil May Cry. And it's still not going to be good. It's not going to be good as the rest. When the game was released and it started to get really great reviews, a lot of people then started to give the game a chance. And then as more and more people, just through word of mouth, got into the game, um, it ended up selling incredibly well, like as, as good as any of the, you know, the best of the DMC series. And it was rated as high as the best of the DMC series. So there was this kind of uh, quiet satisfaction that despite all the negativity that was surrounding the game, we did the right thing, which was to focus on the job that we had to do, that Capcom wanted us to do, and deliver on the quality of game that they expected of us. We didn't change direction, we stuck to the vision that we set out to at the start, and um, I think that's just given us a lot of strength and confidence in the long run, because, you know, the world didn't end. We know all about you, Dante. One of the really nice things that came out of the game was the recognition we received afterwards, so receiving a BAFTA uh, nomination for Best British Game was, was really nice. It's important for the team to know that their, their work is appreciated and things like, uh, like the BAFTAs in particular are very clear specific things you can point to and say, you know what, we did a good job. to people setting out is it will always be hard because there's, it has to be hard for it to be worthwhile. Um, you'll always feel like you're not good enough. If you knew how hard it was, none of us, including myself, would actually embark on this journey of making 
games or, or, or aspiring to making art or, or whatever. So, so I think it's fine to be naive because naive sort of protects you from reality, the reality that, of the pain you're going to face. Um, it's fine to be a little bit um, arrogant, confidence I should say, a, a, a kind of confident arrogance about what you are capable of achieving. I think that's a good thing. It's something a lot of people try and beat out of you, but, but it's a good thing to hold on to that because it'll, it'll keep your drive going. What you create should feel so compelling that nothing seems to get in the way of what you want to create. You know, all these little things that, reasons not to do it, are just obstacles that you can think your way through. My name is Dante. The creative process is seen as a chaotic artistic process, it's not. It's a logical process of divide, conquer, doing things in the right order. Um, if you don't know how to do something, isolate the problem, whether it's an art aesthetic or whether it's a gameplay mechanic, isolate it, work on that, make it work, then move on to the next bit, build a good foundation. Like, yes, everything you want to do will feel disheartening and, and beyond your abilities, but one step at a time. A few steps forwards, a couple of steps back, a few steps forwards, a couple of steps back, and before you know it, you look back and go, wow, how did I get here?